Well, let's just let's begin here. Um, so um, I have a belief that we tend to cherish our lives, that they function for us, and that every once in a while we realize, or hopefully we burn out eventually and come to the point of just loving the gospel and drinking it in and resting more and more in the knowledge of who we are in Christ. And as we take, go to war against the onslaught of accusation, kind of like Joshua the high priest, who on Yom, Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, was probably the godliest man in the community, and Zechariah and Zechariah 3 had a vision of him as being filled with filthy rags in the presence of God as Satan walked back and forth accusing him and as like Satan still uses the law in our life as a believer telling us we're awful Truth is, we are. We're even worse than we think we are. But, praise be to God, there was another who didn't just die on the cross in substitutionary atonement or a sacrifice. I used to have a Greek preach pastor and he his English wasn't like, like yours. And he said, atonement. And instead of saying, this is where the rubber hits the road, he'd say, this is where the tire hits the pavement. And uh, we listen and think through everything. But on atonement that Christ substituted for a people, he, he, the, the wrath of God passes over us because the blood of the lamb is over the doorposts of our heart. But the wrath of God did not pass over his only begotten son. He was the high priest who offered himself as the lamb of God. And he is, you know, our righteousness as well. So he didn't just die on the cross. Otherwise, when he was a baby, maybe he, he could have just died as a substitutionary atonement at that point. But he lived 33 some years a righteous life. And that righteousness matters as the second Adam, as the second, the one who represented us all, who were atoned for. That righteousness is freely offered to all who receive it freely by faith alone. So it's not just his death, but his life that we are so thankful was revealed from heaven and that is received by faith from first to last. Now, on the gospel, or gospel part one, looking at three parts, justification first, if you stood up in churches, evangelical churches, and asked people, what is justification? Only those that, very few, probably, could stand up in the United States anyway and answer the question, what is justification? How, do you think in New Zealand that's that most people know what is the article upon which the Christian or the church stands or falls, said Luther. What is the hinge that opens and closes the door to heaven, said Calvin. What is Romans about, Galatians about, Abraham about it's a right what is justification so what we do is we just admit a lot of us don't know and at our church we go over this sort of thing and we we memorize the shorter catechism answer to that in a prayerful way 
So I acted out like this with my hands in prayer, and I, and I have them chant with me until they can, they don't look, they just can say it so that when they're at the grocery store, when they're at work, on their best day and worst day, they can pray this. And it is just, you know, I am pardoned of all my sins and accepted as righteous in your sight. And I go like this, but only for the righteousness of Christ. Right? His life lived. But only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to me and received by faith alone. I'm pardoned of all my sins and accepted as righteous in your sight, but only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to me and received by faith alone. So I have them chant this. And people come to a class like this and they think, oh, I don't want to participate. I just want to take notes. Because when the Holy Spirit's moving at our church, you know how you can tell? People write faster. <laughs> um, so even the people my age and older memorize it. And it's hard. And guess what I do? I have them say it over and over, and they're like, roll their eyes. And finally, the reluctant even are doing it. Just to have... Uh, memorization righteousness um we gotta you know we gotta all get it because it's shame if you don't get it and everyone else gets it and so then you know i say okay so and so can you say it and they'll go you know they'll say it right in and then they they have they tend to fall into ah, memorization righteousness and all that's as filthy rags because what we just memorized is that the only reason we're pardoned of all our sins and accepted as righteous is for the righteousness of another. A life I did not live. That righteousness was imputed to me. Freely, wonderfully, I was declared righteous. I was credited righteous by faith alone. Then I say, and I'm not doing all this to move fast, but uh, I'll say, all right, let's say Steve had memorized this. I'll say, Steve, okay, it was your best day. Your wife in the morning woke up uh, and you served breakfast to her. And she said, you are the most godly husband any wife could ever have. You trained your children in time with word and prayer, and they memorized justification, and then you, you watch them run across the street to a widow and do good works, and then you went to work, and you led five people to Christ. You're amazing. And uh, you came back, and you came home, and everyone's, Yay, Dad is home! And you laid your pillow down on your head that night and you said, I am pardoned of all my sins and accepted in, as righteous in your sight, but only for the right, not my good day, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to me and received by faith alone. Then I'll call on somebody else. And they, they laugh with me. And uh, I'll say, you know, Let's say his name's Joe. Joe, you had the worst day. Uh, you went off to work in the morning. No one really even acknowledged you at home. And there was a text from your wife saying, I told you to buy milk last night and you forgot at the grocery store. You know, whatever. You had a terrible day at work. Um, your boss told you that your performance is at an all-time low. Um, and um, in fact, one person said, if you're a Christian, I don't want to be one, something like that. And you came home and kids were fighting. They embarrassed you uh, publicly and you laid your head down that night on your pillow. And you said, I am pardoned of all my sins and I'm accepted as righteous in your sight. 
but only for the righteousness of Christ, imputed to me and received by faith alone. So preaching the gospel to yourself is so important so that you, you can renounce the condemnation. You're worthless. You know, a lot of pastors have a lot of condemnation before they come up and preach. It's like, who do you think you are <laughs> preaching to these people? And, um, you know, it's such a great moment to say, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a whore and a murderer. What else you got? Jesus already said that in the Sermon on the Mount, that we're all lust. We all have anger and we all hate. We all murder and we all lust. And thanks be to Christ, his righteousness has been imputed to me. Take that. I remind you of your future. You could remind me of my past. All you want. So we can stand on our best days or worst days. Not in our own righteousness, but we're free. We're more stable. We're less up and down. Because of this forensic, this judicial, this once for all, this righteousness, this position that we have. So that I don't, or you don't, have to vindicate yourself, defend yourself, or prove anything. So on the next page on justification, it says why this is so practical on my best and worst days. There's the Puritan's uh, expression of this doctrine, justification, from 1643. Um, there's some other stuff. I don't know what's in your booklet, but along the lines of justification. Now we're going to jump to adoption because you're a pretty well uh, studied group on adoption. So I think what Andrew was saying is this, this uh, loss of sense of being loved. One of the most difficult truths to believe for Christians is that they're actually loved by God. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us as believers to cry out, Abba, Father, to witness to our spirits at our worst moments, Romans 15, uh, or is it Romans 8, 15, that we are loved, that we are sons and daughters. So preaching the gospel to ourselves, we renounce, you know, I'm not an unwanted orphan. I am wanted and loved. And I don't just have a gospel mantra. I commune with God about that. And that is so hard to believe. But the Holy Spirit empowers us to again and again believe the gospel. We're like fish that go around in an aquarium. They say fish have very short memories. And the fish comes around the aquarium and sees a castle and goes, Oh, a castle. And then goes around, comes back around, sees the castle. Oh, a castle. We are the same way. After I preach on Sunday, I forget by the time I get home. And so we're always in need. I used to wonder after I became a Christian, why do we come to church? This is for the non-Christians to hear the gospel. Why do we have to hear the gospel again? Why do we have to have communion and hear again? This is my body broken for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Shed the, you know, the cup of the new covenant. Uh, I'm tired. This is the new covenant cup in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins, drink from it, all of you. Why do we have to be reminded that we're forgiven and loved over and over again as Christians? Because before we're Christians, Satan sort of leaves us alone. 
Most non-Christians think, I'm okay. Things are okay. I don't need God. Most Christians, and maybe you've wondered as a counselor, brother, but a lot of Christians struggle with being these awful, dreadful thoughts of condemnation. Most Christians, like you'd think the non-Christians should come under the law and sense they are condemned, but most Christians, the, it's like they're, they're left alone on that. But Christians struggle with awful thoughts of doubt that God would ever love them. And uh, so the, the, I encourage you to meditate on the gospel. I gave biblical references. I gave quotes. I love this quote from Spurgey for the clergy, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Ian, you know about his son, Thomas. In Hamilton, there was a church established there. But uh, Spurgeon said, uh, the next page at the bottom, while I regarded God as a tyrant, I thought my sin a trifle. But when I knew him to be my father, then I mourned that I could ever kick against him. When I thought God was hard, I found it easy to sin. But when I found God so kind, so good, so overflowing with compassion, I smote or I beat my beat upon my breast to think that I could ever have rebelled against one who loved me so and sought my good. So if you want to change or see people change, it's not through condemnation. It's through re-putting re forth again the gospel that God loves us. Um, that's what David, I did my dissertation on Edwards and David Brainerd, he, Edwards wrote, worked together a book on David Brainerd's journals. And Brainerd noticed that when he preached to the Native Americans on condemnation and all that, there was little change, but when he spoke on the love of God, it was actually then that they began to weep and come under conviction. So I just uh, illustrate this when we've had uh, what five kids and we have all these grandkids now, and when they learn to walk, generally speaking, they walk across our living room or one of my children, adult children's living room. Um, lounge, you know, area, and they, there's sofa and that around, uh, couches, and so they, mom or dad lets them go, they're about two years old, they look like drunken sailors, you know, they got a big stomach and a milk bottle, and they start across, and they make the first step, or maybe two, and everyone in the family saying, yay, go Gideon! You know, go Micaiah or, or uh, Nora or whatever, which one it is. And the moment they start to fall, we catch them. We say, good job. Let's try that again. I mean, so much love. So proud of them. How much more our attempts at obedience does our Heavenly Father love us? He is not kicking us and saying, you should have taken four steps, not two, you know, should be stronger. He knows we are children. He loves us. He's a, he looked at the orphanage of this life and in love chose us to be his children. We have had over uh, 25 kids adopted in our church from other nations. And every time, most every time, a, a family goes to get the child and brings the child at the airport. Our church tries to be there. And uh, we welcome them. And how much more does God love us and welcome us into his family and he's never going to stop loving you because he never began loving you. 
He always loved you. He loved you from all eternity and chose you to be adopted as his son or daughter. It'll never stop. Jeremiah, I think it is, says, I loved you with the everlasting love. So justification, adoption, and finally, part three here, definitive sanctification. If you would turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is one of those verses that, or words that um, I think are important. It's important for us to understand. I have quotes from John Murray, who taught at Westminster, where um, Pastor Peter Reynolds went. And I have biblical uh, verses from uh, a systematic theology uh, by Robert Raymond, who's gone home to be with the Lord. And uh, anyway, but in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those, what does your Bible say? Next word, to those past tense. And I'm reading that and I'm going, what? Because I'm not, I ain't sanctified yet, I don't think. But what does that mean? Sometimes it says to the saints who are in Rome, but then turn to page chapter 6 and verses, let's read 9 through 11 because they're so scary. Um, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drink drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And... Such were some of you, but you were washed, past tense, you were sanctified, past tense, you were justified, past tense, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So there is progressive sanctification. Brother, we were talking about methods and the means of grace where we put to death or put off the old nature and we bring to life, as John Owen talks about, vivification. Our new nature, we, we feed and bring alive and we, we strain out the life of our sinful nature. That's progressive sanctification. But on the front end, positionally, in Christ, who we are, we are holy. We are saints. We are, there's been a definitive, radical breach with your sinful nature. A one-time, definitive, boom. And you were set apart anointed with the Holy Spirit, gifted with charismata, gifted with spiritual gift is, gifts, I don't know, gift, gifts, and you were named. I mean, you are in God's sight a saint. Holy, past tense, sanctified. So I believe this is important as well as to remind yourself, I am a saint. I am not a victim. So in the U.S. culture more, and I don't know if it's here as much, but people are often use the idea that they're a victim. If you only st understood um, why I was so awful and rude because, you know, you know, Karen, my sweetheart, I was rude because 
there was somebody who drove real slow in front of me on the way home, and uh, that's why I'm late, and, and I got upset. I had a really hard day today, and you remember way back when, when I was young, this bad event happened, and so any court in the land would understand that I'm excused for being so rude this afternoon. And um, that's begging for understanding but not for mercy. Would you forgive me? I was wrong or whatever. But sometimes with our sinful nature, we could, um, we could say, well, I'm a victim of my sinful nature and deny that there's been a radical breach with it. This is like Romans 6. I, uh, for those that love uh, credo baptism, that I've seen union with Christ, I've been buried with him, his death, union with Christ, and raised to life with him. So, if we don't remember we're saints and that this old nature, though it, there's a, a constant war with our new nature, if we don't reckon or remember that it has been crucified with Christ, we can or uh, tend to say, I'm a victim of my sinful nature. I mean, there's no way I can change. It's too much. And this can be a helpful doctrine and um, a reminder that, that that's not true. And so the more we slay it and put it to death, the more we can rule it and go to war. we got to go to war. But we have this definitive break that the Holy Spirit gave us. We have an empowerment. And so not perfectionism, but we're not victims either. We need to rise up and go to war. So what did we say during this time today? We said it matters what God says about who each of us is or who we are in Christ. That you are made in the image of God. That you never lost that glory. That if you weren't here, your unique thumbprint we would miss you. And that you and I, we are not only glorious, but we're ruins. So we are very broken and fallen image bearers. And we're vulnerable to condemnation. We lost original righteousness and our autonomous claim is to try and establish our own. And therefore, in the midst of a fallen world, when tragedy happens, our own self, false, you know, sinful nature, our own conscience, Satan accusing the accuser, beats us down with condemnation. But since we're united with Christ, we take that condemnation, those condemning thoughts, those accusations, captive and renounce them and we preach the gospel to ourselves, and we say, I am pardoned of all my sins, God. I am accepted as righteous in your sight, but only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to me and received by faith alone. On my best days, on my worst days, it's still true. And I am your son, or as a woman, your daughter, and I'm loved as I attempt obedience I do it knowing you're not a tyrant. You are a loving father. And, and you know, around my heart still closely twine. That cord that drew me with eternal love, I say, I am his and he is mine. And um, then we have had a radical 
breach with our sinful nature. I am a saint. You are a saint. And the Holy Spirit has empowered you, and dwelt you, gifted you, and he is determined to continue to put your sinful nature to death so that we even want to pursue righteousness and be like Christ. As we focus on Christ outside of ourselves, the Holy Spirit transforms us from one degree of glory to the next, just gazing upon his beauty, actually. 2 Corinthians 3. So that here is a summary. Let me close in prayer. Lord, we pray you would free us from lousy thoughts, from the evil one, the world, our sinful nature, other people, and help us to give you the only authority to tell us who we are and that you would give us joy in Jesus Christ, our righteousness, our wisdom, our sanctification, our treasure, our great high priest. And we thank you that one day we will stand before you glorified. Even our false humility will no longer be there. The penalty of sin gone, the power of sin broken, the presence of sin won't be there. We'll be transformed. We'll be clothed with immortality. We will stand in your presence. We will stand before you, Jesus, as your bride. And you'll say like Adam, at last. And you will look at us and we will look at you and we will not fall apart. You will enjoy us. We will enjoy you because we will be made in your image and your likeness. And we pray in light of that day, we would rise up and go to battle against the evil one and our sinful nature and get the focus on you and loving others. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. say thank you to Bob for coming and for sharing his heart with us today. Thank you. Thank you for coming and hopefully we can see you sometime soon in the future. So thank you very much. Go in peace. May the grace and the peace of the Lord be with us all. Amen.